Hello, everyone, and welcome to CG Seminar 386. I'm Lee Rensimer, I'm a research associate with the Center. Um, I'm standing in for Simon Margeson, who, curiously enough, is in Japan at the moment. Um, <laughs> so today we'll be hearing from uh, Rah uh, Mahbube Rahshandaru on teaching English and teaching in English in Japan as foreign, female, and non-native. Before I hand over to Mahbube, there are some brief housekeeping points to mention. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted online on the CEG website in due course. A transcript of the chat function conversation will also be posted. Please keep yourself muted unless you have been asked to speak or ask a question. We um, there, There's no need to have your video on during the webinar, but uh, please do so when, when asking a question. Um, it's always nice for the, the presenter to, to know who they're speaking with. Um, we recommend using the speaker view, which you can see in the top right corner of your screen, so you can more clearly see who's talking. So to ask a question, use the chat function. Uh, write out the question you wish to ask. And then at the end of the presentation, if your question is selected, you'll be invited to ask it yourself directly. So when invited to ask a question, please unmute yourself, switch on your video, and state your name and where you're from. Okay, so I will now, um, and now I'm going to pass over to uh, Mahbube. Um, Mahbube Rashandru is an associate lecturer of English at Kwansei Gaikun University. Um, <clears throat> she additionally serves as leadership team coordinator of the East Asia Regional Group of Integrating Content and Language in Higher Education, or ICLHE. Mahbube, I invite you to uh, share your screen when you're ready, and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Lee, for the nice introduction. I'm going to share my slides now. Could you see it? Okay. Right? Okay. Yes. So thank you so much. Um, as Lee has kindly introduced me, my name is Mahbube Rakhshanderu. Today, I'm going to talk about a research project that I've been working on since 2021 with my colleague, Natasha Hashimoto, who is not here today. Uh, so today, I'm going to share um, uh, my side of the um, narratives uh, in our uh, study. Uh, in the abstract, we mentioned that our paper is forthcoming. It's out now. You can um, have access to it online by scanning this QR code or searching the title, uh, Native Speakerism in Higher Education Through the Eyes of Non-Japanese NNEST, which stands for Non-Native English Speaking Teachers. So to tell you a little bit about my educational background, um, I uh, graduated from um, the University of Tehran in the capital of Iran, uh, Tehran. Uh, and when I was 22, I moved to Japan. I'm originally from Iran and I studied at Osaka University, both of my master's and PhD. Uh, where at Osaka University, um, I studied internationalization of higher education and uh, critical studies in transformative education. Uh, my first exposure to native speakerism was in 2014 when I took a course by um, Professor uh, Nobuyuki Hino at Osaka University. And I remember at the time I was like this the whole idea is so unfamiliar to me. I was studying at a very diverse lab. Uh, I was never feeling like I have an accent and um, I had no problem communicating with my um, fellow lab mates and uh, like, you know, having the so-called native accents like was kind of a rare thing in our lab. <laughs> so I've never felt marginalized. And I graduated in 2019. After graduation, when I started job hunting, this was when I noticed I'm not eligible to apply for so many jobs because I'm not native. And uh, my PhD research and also my master's research, it was on a completely different topic. I um, researched 
um, university support for English speaking international uh, students at Japanese universities. And then since 2019, I became interested in this topic because I was like, wow, this is like a huge um, issue. And it's not only in Japan, it's like basically everywhere. Um, so uh, this is a study that I conducted with uh, my uh, colleague, Dr. Natasha Hashimoto. In this study, we used dual ethnography. This is a research method um, that is um, you know, trendy now. It was introduced about 10 years ago by these two scholars, uh, Norris and Sawyers. It's a collaborative research methodology. Uh, it's based on the life um, histories and we try to provide multiple understanding. Um, we do as ethnographers use ourselves to assist ourselves and others to better understand the phenomena on the investigation, which is native speakerism in our study. Uh, we chose this study because we could examine our practices and it can also help us learn from our differences. It can help us also grow. And we can remember, interpret, co-construct, and make sense of events, our actions or reactions, feelings, and not making a truth claim. Um, there is an ongoing, um, you know, growing research literature in uh, dual ethnography. Here are a couple of them. And specifically, this one uh, by Lawrence and uh, Nagashima was um, uh, published in Japan about English language teaching in Japan. And uh, the two scholars um, worked on the intersectionality of gender, sexuality, race, and native speakerness. Um, I assume um, some of you are familiar with the idea of native speakerism and the ideologies. I would like to briefly mention some of the important points related to that. It was coined by Adrian Holiday um, in 2003. And after that, since then, it has been uh, discussed in so many different scholarly research works. It's been seen as a culturally superior model or sometimes is being referred to as labor or ideology. And uh, it's not only the English proficiency, uh, it's also about qualification or pedagogical, you know, approaches of the teacher. So it's it's being seen as like um, both of the um, criteria for English language teachers or uh, speakers of English. Um, and more recently, it's been discussed in the, in the literature as a form of discrimination, linguistic imperialism, and racism. Um, in the context of Japan, um, in 2003 and also before that, um, it's been mentioned the word native speaker of English. Um, um, for example, this one, the action plan to cultivate Japanese um, with uh, Japanese students with the English abilities. Um, a native speaker of English teacher provides a valuable opportunity for students to learn living English and familiarize themselves with foreign language and cultures. And in the mixed documents, um, repeatedly foreign language has been seen as like English, um, like kind of counterpart and uh, also culture is being associated with um, West culture or um, more specifically with native, so-called native culture. Uh, this slide is from um, Galloway's, Nicola Galloway's lecture um, for the University of Tokyo. And uh, you could see different examples of the textbooks um, related to the like superiority of native speakers. Um, for example, the farewell to Japanese English being, um, you know, Japanese English being seen as the deficit model and um, like the ultimate goal has been, you know, trying to be able to be understood uh, by native, uh, native speakers and being able to communicate by native speakers. Um, so in the literature, uh, in Japan, usually native English speaking teachers are being um, on one side and on the other side, we have Japanese teachers of English. Uh, for example, this is from um, 
the syllabus um, of one of my first classes that I thought um, four years ago. And I was categorized as a native speaker of English, um, even though they didn't believe that I'm a native speaker of English and I'm not. <laughs> and the other category, non-native English speaker, it's being, uh, you know, um, written in the parentheses that it's like equivalent with the Japanese teachers. And yeah, so it's been repeated um, in different scholarly uh, works. So the disparity between uh, native English speaking teachers and Japanese teachers, uh, the native teachers has been seen in the literature as role models, specifically about pronunciation, accent, and knowledge about foreign culture, the producers of what is called real English, accuracy or authenticity. Uh, there is a predominance of white English teachers um, in the social media and also in the archival industry, which is Japanese, which is English conversational schools. And for the Japanese uh, teachers, uh, even though in the literature it's, it's being said that they have more tenure positions, um, they are usually being seen as team teachers, having the role of security and support, uh, facilitating the interaction and the sources of grammar. Um, so research in um, Europe, the US and United Kingdom shows a greater value on quality of teachers uh, rather than on the nationality or the linguistic background and native speakerism has um, been questioned. Um, on the other hand, still, some research shows that better English proficiency uh, is linked to the, a greater desire for having native English teachers. And in um, Asia, specifically East and Southeast Asia, there is a shortage of research about native speakers, um, even though there is a growing body of research um, focusing on that. Uh, so in Japan, as I mentioned, there is a clear distinction between Japanese teachers and native teachers. Um, it's been reported that Japanese students usually have negative attitudes toward their own English um, because um, they favor Anglo-American English and they are worried about the correctness of their English. They want to use real English. And um, moving forward, um, some researchers such as uh, Nobuyuki Hino that I mentioned earlier have, have been working on research um, that shows that um, some of the, um, for example, English textbooks or um, archival industries uh, in English co conversation schools are trying to um, focus on the importance of Japanese values and um, the Anglo-Americanized English for multicultural expression. So. I think we are going through a transition phase in Japan. Uh, so how we collected data, uh, we exchanged emails with Dr. Natasha Hashimoto. We had a Google document diary. We exchanged a lot of comments um, for about a year. We met on Zoom and we had face-to-face -face meeting. We also um, got to know each other through social media, even though it wasn't like really part of the dual ethnography. Uh, we found uh, these three specific themes um, related to um, our shared experiences. And I'm going to specifically talk about my own narratives. Job search, which was the main one, work environment, and lastly, students and teacher identity. So um, firstly, about my positionality, I'm Iranian, but I'm naturalized recently. So I have Japanese citizenship but at work, I'm still counted as non-Japanese teacher. Uh, I'm a non-native English speaker of English from the expanding circle. I'm educated in Iran and Japan, as I mentioned earlier. Um, I'm multilingual. I speak uh, Persian or Farsi as my first language, English as second, Japanese as third, Arabic and French as fourth. I'm married, I have two children and I'm working full-time. Uh, my agency as a woman in Japan is enabled compared to Iran, even though um, in the literature, um, repeatedly um, the ELT, English language teaching industry, has been reported as male-dominated and not in favor of um, female teachers because I have felt so marginalized as a non-native English-speaking teacher 
with my job hunting, I haven't really felt like I'm marginalized because of my gender. Um, and I was lucky enough to have a supportive work environment. And my professional identity grown uh, dramatic, dramatically uh, during the emergency online teaching. Um, so related to job search, as I mentioned, the um, the you know the initial idea for me to start doing research about this um, research project was because I wasn't eligible for so many jobs. I even tried. I wrote emails to a couple of different universities who advertise they are looking for native English speaking teachers, and no luck. I didn't receive any reply. Uh, but as for the positive experience for eligibility. I'm a, a speaking examiner for Cambridge and I was treated exactly like everyone else and my current job, the interview and everything was exactly like everyone else. Um, please take a look at these uh, quotes from my experience. Uh, the first two specifically, these are um, not only related to non-natives. When me and Natasha and uh, Dr. Hashimoto we presented our research at different conferences, a lot of other female teachers, they mentioned that they have received similar comments at the job interviews about their husband and about if they can work late. So I guess this is the type of like... Um, reason that um, we have these issues related to gender, specifically in um, Japanese uh, ELT, Japan, in ELT in Japan. And uh, the next quote here is from an interview for a part-time position. And the whole interview was about talking about the possibility of a war between Iran and the US. Um, no question about my qualification. And surprisingly, they offered me a job and I accepted it because I had no choice. Um, it was so hard for me to find any job. Um, the next one is from a welcome party for new part-time teachers. And uh, my coordinator asked me, where are you from? And when I said Iran, uh, the coordinator said, oh, and stopped talking to me, immediately left. And the next one is from an email that they um, asked me about like my CV. I don't have any like information that I'm a native teacher. Why I'm not native? So what can I do about it? This was after they offered me a job. And eventually they could um, talk to the you know faculty members who question my non-native status and I could continue having this job. Um, the next um, shared theme was about the work environment. Um, at work, at first, especially the first year, I felt marginalized because uh, my workplace um, was like male dominated, about 80% men. And um, I was the only non-native person. Small talk was a big challenge for me in the beginning. And I experienced, especially the first year, microaggressions. Um, please take a look at this one, this quote specifically. You had a grammar mistake in your materials today. And this happened to me repeatedly. And when I shared it with my other non-native speak speaking teachers, they um, said that they have experienced similar, you know, um, attitudes from their colleagues. Um, and like the native teachers, they're not receiving any of that. Even though like, because I'm feeling like, kind of insecure about my materials, I always read them a couple of times to make sure there is no grammar mistakes, there is no typo in there. And uh, sometimes I see my colleagues, they have like a lot of typos in their mistake. But my, uh, you know, uh, material is being seen as sometimes, not all the time, having grammar mistake in it. Um, and like typos in the other materials written by native speaking teachers, not even receiving any comment. And then another one is um, from one colleague who has been trying constantly to teach me different English words and feeling like this is funny. Like, hey, Mavuve, do you know the meaning of this word? And not waiting for me to even like open my mouth <laughs> and teaching the vocabulary in front of everyone. I was like, I know this word. And then the colleague continues. 
So this happened to me specifically in the first year. I think in the second year after they got to know more uh, about me, um, eventually everything, including the small talk, got better. Uh, I'm working in um, a coordinated program uh, as teams. Um, I have a very supportive director and I have a very supportive work environment, which is great. I really appreciate it. And in terms of pedagogy, I'm um, trying to use critical language pedagogy, um, including global Englishes, different varieties of English. And I, uh, I've i been using COIL, Collaborative Online International Learning, uh, in my classes um, since four years ago. Um, specifically about my... Um, boss, the director of our program, I would like to mention two points. And I think her role in uh, my, you know, growth in my work has been like really, really big. And I really appreciate it. Um, Yalda night, which is um, toward the end of December, it's around the similar time of Christmas. And uh, my boss brought cookies, Christmas cookies for everyone. And she brought these two pomegranates for me because we use them in Yalda. And she wrote this uh, Shabe Yalda Mubarak in Farsi um, by herself without even asking me how to do it. She Googled it herself and she did it. And she gave them to me in the morning. And I was so happy that she gave me like this different uh, you know, present instead of Christmas cookies. And uh, we also had a chat together with our colleagues about Yalda, what is Yalda, the similarities of Yalda and Christmas. And the next one is um, from a text from her on Slack. I'm thinking about you all the time with all the stuff in Iran must be so difficult, scary, distracting. Last year when uh, Masa Amini was killed by the morality police in Iran and um like there was a huge movement going on in Iran. Um, I was constantly worried about like everything going on back home. And um, not only my boss, a lot of my other colleagues, they were, you know, supporting me. And um, that was like a great feeling to feel like I'm not alone. I'm not on my own. Um, and the last finding is about teacher identity and relationship with students. The first quote is from one of my students the first year I started teaching. And when I see people use phrases like raining cats and dogs, like our teacher, the student was referring to me, I'm so impressed and I think, oh, she's a native speaker. Uh, this student gave me this comment, um, even though I introduced myself and the first class as a non-native English speaker and told my students that I'm from Iran. Um, I, I think because I briefly mentioned it in the beginning of the semester, a lot of students, they forgot about it. Um, little by little, because of having a supportive boss and supportive colleagues, I also um, became like more open about my non-native English speaker, like uh, identity with my students. And um, this is a more recent comment from one of my students. Oh, wow, you mostly learned English in Japan. I'd like to speak English like you in the future. So I think sharing my experience with my students really gives them more confidence in like, they don't need to, you know, be a native English speaker to be able to communicate with other people. And this is something that they can do as they see me, I'm doing it um, here and talking with them in English. And my English is mostly from Japan because back home in Iran, I wasn't really using English. I studied Persian language back home. Um, about my teacher identity and agency to talk about it more, specifically after uh, publishing our paper, the um, second phase of our study, we noticed that the um, teacher agency that we have gives us a lot of opportunities to uh, not only grow ourselves, but also try to use uh, materials uh, or uh, activities in our classrooms to give more confidence to our students to be able to speak in ELF English as a lingua franca. 
Um, so the course materials that I um, have at the moment, um, I'm working with a strictly coordinated, coordinated program, um, but um, wherever I can, I have like a choice. I try to use materials from diverse countries and backgrounds to provide opportunities for students to learn and think about different cultures. For example, we use a website X Reading for graded readers, and I try to choose uh, books with like different um, characters from different backgrounds, different cultures, um, different like genres, and uh, specifically from marginalized backgrounds. And as I mentioned earlier, I'm very open about my um, English as a second language speaker identity. Um, I try to use uh, materials that give um, more opportunities um, to students to reflect on global Englishes, different varieties of English, um, trying to have discussion with the students about what they already know to build cultural awareness about diversity in, in English, showcasing the differences even among the native varieties of English, um, whenever possible doing um, activities such as internet research and group work to learn about different varieties of English, activities about ownership of English, and for students to reflect on their own identities as well. I'm gonna see how much time I have. So um, I would like to briefly show you some examples um, about uh, my classes. Um, this is an example from a CLIL class, Content and Language Integrated Learning, that I'm teaching in the fall semester. It's called Internationalization of Higher Education. And I use COIL, Collaborative Online International Learning, with um, my students. Um, they do virtual exchange activities with um, students in other countries. And uh, this year, they um, just completed it. Uh, they uh, collaborated with universities in the US, in Mexico, in Turkey, or previously called, uh, called Turkey, and Germany. Um, we do lots of team-based learning. And um, this is an example from um, an activity related to the lesson on multiculturalism. We try to view issues from different perspectives and I always try to use relatable examples for students and follow them with small group discussion and then having um, a more like a discussion with the whole class. Uh, we watched um, different um, YouTube uh, videos, short YouTube videos um, um, from um, the past until now, and we talked about the internationalist binary before um, in the past before um, between Japan and the West, uh, then moving to globalism between Japan and the rest of the world, and then um, the universal spaces these days based on understanding the differences. Uh, this is a comment from one of my students, and I received a lot of similar comments from um, the students. I feel my opinion about multiculturalism was changed compared to the first lesson. And the student said, I want to reevaluate diversity and identities. So even hearing this from one student, um, yeah, it's like a huge success for me. It makes, makes me feel so happy especially when they say they feel more confident with their English. Um, an example to uh, watch a video and look at different um, differences between um, English in the UK, US, Australia, um, three different YouTubers, they look at pictures and they talk about how would they refer to this picture and student can see even within the um like the um, inner circle, um, we have some differences. And I think my time is up. I don't know if you would like to take a look at some more examples. Maybe when we talk, uh, the slides also are available. Uh, you can take a look at uh, more examples. Um, let me go to the end to talk about some concluding points. And if you'd like to talk about more examples, I'm more than happy to talk about it. 
so we found dual ethnography as a very useful method because every time we presented about our study, we, um, you know, could collaborate uh, with other teachers and we could learn more about their experiences. Um, we, we think that we need more of this research, especially related to privilege, gender, intersected with L1 status, nationality, accent, race. Um, so the three themes from our study, hiring practice, ownership of English language, um, both learner and teachers and workplace support, uh, we think that they are really important. And what we can do specifically as teachers is working on our teacher agency and identity and uh, try to um, um, empower students. Here are the references. And thank you so much. Um, the slides also are available and you can find me on ResearchGate and LinkedIn here. Thank you. Well, that was fantastic, Mahbube. Thank you. Thank for you. That. I think it's a it's a really uh, riveting and and um, uh, I mean it's very uh, contemporary in 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 so many of the debates we're having in global higher education um, forums around. Um, um, <clears throat> I mean, this is now another native speakerism is is another uh, professional identity and personal identity that 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 comes to the fore. In our practice, uh, in our interactions with students, in our belonging, um, and uh, and it it as you point out, it goes so often un unexamined or underexamined in in the literature. Mm -hmm. um, so thank you for that. Uh, this is this has been really enjoyable. Um, thank you. I'm going to uh, open the floor up to questions for Mahbube, um, and if if I may, as as chair, um, I'd like to to have a go at the first question, if that's okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> um, no, I mean, I would just like to, like as I was saying, that that there's, um, you know, this is this is very uh, relevant to so many issues that, and debates that we're having at the moment. I'd like to hear your thoughts on how native speakerism in Japan, more broadly, how it aligns with 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 whiteness and coloniality, mm -hmm. and you know, two two huge. Uh, uh, projects of power and inequality, um, but but how how will they relate to non-native speakerism? I mean, either as a political project or 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 as an intellectual lens for understanding how how they operate and 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 sustain unequal relations of power. Hmm. Um, I guess my thinking is this: uh, you know, being being uh, you you mentioned native speakerist ideology, and right. so being a native speaker, as you point out, it's something that you can never achieve or fully obtain um yet it provides this framework uh for 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 aspirations for desire for value and um and it makes meaning of of the self and the other in relation to, to language acquisition and belonging and, and so on mm. um right yeah yeah, so, yeah. Uh, so so i'd love to hear uh how yeah how, how, how you find this relates to whiteness uh to, to coloniality all these, these big things um, mm -hmm. and, and also, if I may, just an extension to that question would be like, where do you see native speakerism stemming from or being re reinforced by? Um, mm -hmm. Like how much of this is based on students' experiences of, of, of like a qualitative or pedagogical difference in the classroom? Or how much is this based on these deeper issues of, of, of you know, having uh, sub very subjectivities uh, that, that see, um, you know, value in whiteness and 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 mm. native speakerism or are they are all they're all bunched together and you can't pick them apart mm -hmm. thank you so much for your questions so about whiteness in the literature it's been mentioned and um uh, actually i conducted research with about uh, 300 japanese university students and i asked them about their perceptions related to an ideal english language teacher for them and I, um, I can probably share my slides in a second, like uh, of a part of that study. So um, I used um, a study by scholars. They um, used pictures of black teachers, white teachers, and Asian teachers. And they asked the students about their perception, which one they would prefer. So in the beginning, um, they said that they would prefer white teachers then they would prefer Asian teachers and finally black teachers. 
But then when they ask the students about like why, what is the reason for their like preference, uh, they mostly mention that it's just because these teachers, like black teachers, they're not that familiar to them. Um, the stereotype that they have for an English teacher is a white teacher. And it usually comes from the textbooks. Like if you look at the textbooks in Japanese um, schools, still a lot of them for an English speaking character in the textbook, they use a white person, blonde hair, blue eye. And I had it actually as a part of my slide, which I didn't have, let me show you briefly. Um, I didn't have time to show if I go back here. So I use this example. This one on the right is from a textbook in Japan. And I have this example on the left for my students that they compare them together. And I ask them, so this one on the left is from Pakistan. And I ask them, what kind of character do they see in these pictures? And I ask them, do they want to see like a... Um, student look like them in the textbook and a lot of them they're like yeah why do we need to have like these type of characters and as I mentioned and uh, Nobuyuki Hino sensei professor you know also mentioned to us like a couple of years ago even like in 2014 um, textbooks are changing we are little by little seeing this transition in the materials but um, the hiring practice, I would say, in my opinion, it's like the biggest issue. So I would say students are very, very open-minded when they get exposed to different ideas. They are very open to accept the change and to, you know, learn different varieties of English. Um, and in my study also, let me show you, I think that's that was just showing you, um, let me find this part. This is a study that I conducted with um, 300 Japanese, about 300 Japanese students. Maybe if I can share this slide with you. So these are the pictures that Rivers and Ross used their study and they found out that the um, let me go to the next part. There is a strong preference for white, male specifically, and even the age, 30 to 35, originate even the country, basically United States. So even the native like speakers, they have the hierarchy. Uh, possessing conversational Japanese ability. So this is also another preference and having five to 10 years of teaching experience. And, um, when I, um, when uh, so in their study, when they uh, manipulated um, the, um, like with the focus group that they had and the other groups that they have, they mani manipulated the pictures, um, they found that the influence of race was seemingly neglect neglected. So there is like this stereotype going on, but um, similarly in my study, uh, students mentioned the same thing, but when I um, asked them about the reason, they said that they feel like white teachers, especially male white teachers, they would have fun classes. It was the most important thing for students. They wanted a fun class. And then they, after like we talked a little bit, I didn't try to, you know, impose any idea. They themselves said that they tried to look at the smile how kind they think the teachers look and their experience or knowledge. So um, similarly, um, it's just because the stereotypes that they have about these, you know, characters that they kind of grow up with, learn English with these type of characters. They've always seen these teachers. Um, so when they get exposed to different, you know, teachers from different backgrounds, um, I think students are very, very ready to accept that change. But um, with the the biggest issue with the hiring is a bit the hiring practice. Um, and uh, as I mentioned, I think things are changing. We are going through a transition phase, but changing very, very slowly. This is a very, very big ideology 
with the students, I think we can try our best and they are very ready, a lot of them, but uh, things at the top also, I think the shift is coming from the bottom to the top. As things are changing from the bottom little by little, eventually it's going to change also at the top. And seeing like people like my boss, who is American, white American, and she is like amazing, so supportive, um, I, it makes me very hopeful that things are going to change little by little in the future. I hope I could answer your questions. <laughs> That's a very comprehensive question, uh, response. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. That's great. Um, Thank you. Yeah, so there's clearly a lot of intersecting, well, intersectionality in, in, in all of this. Um, right. Um, which I could follow up with, but I'm going to take now the uh, question from Kashmir Kar. Would you like to come in and, and ask your question? And Kashmir, if you have trouble connecting, I can ask it on your behalf. Um, I can see the question in the yeah. chat, right? Kashmir, I'm going to go ahead and ask your question. Um, so, uh, we, so Kashmir would like to to ask. So, who mm. was or who is pulling up, pulling you up right. on your grammar? And I think that's the the example you gave where you you were being checked. Right, right, right. So all of these they they come from white male native English speaker speaking teachers. This one as well. Um, somehow, again, like this is a stereotype, and I think I, I label this as microaggression because I think that this colleague is not having any bad intention. They just, you know, by looking at me and then hearing my accent, they believe that I might make some mistake. And especially this happened in the first year. And I was, you know, repeatedly receiving the same comment and I was reading it and it was no grammar mistake in there, right? It was like, for example, a typo, one E was like, you know, missing. And they had a lot of similar, you know, uh, typos. Sometimes it happens, like when you type fast, you have this, um, you know, mistake. But labeling it as grammar mistake, um, I don't know. <laughs> like usually non-natives are being seen, as I also mentioned in the literature, as good grammar teachers. But um, yeah, I guess this is like a kind of stereotype. And as I mentioned, I've had um, similar experiences with um, like similar issue um, from my other non-native English speaking teachers. Yeah. Or um, like one of my friends mentioned that always there is a native person checking her work. Like no, no one else's work is being checked, but there is like this, again, stereotype. We have this word native check or native checku. <laughs> so when you make like an essay or a document or you write something, a native person should check it for you. Um, my students, sometimes they come and they give me some documents and they ask me like, teacher, can you do native check for me? And I just tell them I'm not a native. Is that okay? <laughs> and they're like, mm, but your English is good. <laughs> so yes. <laughs> um, yeah. So there is this uh, stereotype that native um, need to check the documents. Otherwise, there might be some mistake in it. And yeah, I think this this colleague also after the first year, um, he stopped asking me about this kind of questions. But it was basically the first year. Wow. I have an accent, which they say. <laughs> so they, they also have different accents, right? They come from different English speaking countries, but they say you have an accent. So I was seen as like kind of someone who should be checked for grammar mistakes or typos. <laughs> Maybe this goes back to my earlier question about the overlaps between race and non-native speakerism. Um, and, you know, if if you had a, let's say, white male teacher who was a non-native English speaker, would they be, do you think they would be called out for, for these sorts of small grammatical transgressions? That's a good question. Um, maybe not as much. Like I, the friends that I have and I talk to them, oh yes, 
uh, whiteness again. Yeah. So I have friends who are not white, but are male and they have experienced the same thing. Mm. The thing is like, you know, the white men here, almost all the time they are native. Like I haven't seen any <laughs> white, maybe very rarely I've seen someone who is white male and non-native. Because it reminds me of, um, you know, experiences that colleagues have shared with me that are mm. not, not with regards to native speaker uh, or, or being um, in an English language uh, uh, teaching environment, but um, just in, in being a non-white teacher in a majority white classroom where they feel that their their expertise is being checked, um, that they're that they're, you know, their 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 grip over not the mm. knowledge of the discipline is constantly being right. questioned um and, and they they feel like they are subject to greater scrutiny than their white colleagues are mm. by, by students and so i just wonder if that's you know it, it sounds like an identical sort of uh mm. more than a microaggression isn't it i wouldn't be surprised i think yeah this can happen mm -hmm. um yeah, I still, you know, to date, after four years of working uh, in that environment, even though it's supportive, I sometimes feel like, what am I doing here? <laughs> you know, it's, it's, I'm constantly being reminded that I'm very different um, from some colleagues, <laughs> um, not, not all. So this is a very, I, I said, I'm, I mentioned earlier, I'm very lucky to have a supportive working environment, but um yeah, not like I'm sometimes I feel like I'm kind of invisible, like they're talking to each other and not seeing me <laughs> as being existent there, even after like three or four years of working there. So I wouldn't be surprised if I like hear about a black teacher feeling like they're invisible or they're like being their expertise is being questioned. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have a comment from you, Kanazawa. Uh, mm -hmm. It's more of a comment than a question, but uh, you do, would you like to come in and, and share? Yeah, hello. <laughs> oh, it's so nice to see you. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so you talked about a lot about this Professor Nobuyuki Hino, so basically yes. now <laughs> I'm in his position now. So yeah, I'm good uh -huh. to know that he's very aware of those you know, uh, diversity. Also, I also my experience, I also, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm very young, but still <laughs> relatively, I guess. So when I was... Uh, learning English in my junior high school and high school. I also remember there are a lot of the main characters, like some Kenyan, mm. like, some, like, a, like, a, so mm. like introducing some Kenyan, uh, like, a, right. uh, greetings or some Aboriginal people, or mm -hmm. uh, maybe mm -hmm. even some like Hawaiian, some indigenous culture. So mm -hmm. there are a lot of those like, diversities. Of course, it is still true that some main characters are those white mm. guys right. or stuff. But, but still, uh, I think they, at least they're trying to include a little more of those mm -hmm. um, cultural topics. And also I found this paper published, I think, uh, three years ago or something. So they survey, sorry, it's all in Japanese, but basically what it says is that yeah, 2016, those like national uh, junior high school textbook they included a lot of more like diverse topics although there are some uh like uh, white people uh some superiority idea not not an idea but more like dominant view but so in that case maybe they are gradually <laughs> improving changing for the good so hopefully that could be some silver lining for that yeah so just some comment thank you uh, in the in terms of this this progress that that you describe and uh, you described and, and and both of you have um what happens when in a classroom you challenge uh, a student on either microaggression uh, at that moment or or just in a one-to-one -one conversation when you have this when you talk about your experiences um you know being othered uh, as a non-native speaker how, how do they tend to respond to that Is it a question for me or for, for you? Oh, sorry, that is that's my movie. That's a question for you. Oh, okay, so are you asking about students' reactions? Uh, yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, I suppose it applies to anyone um, mm -hmm. in in the context uh, where right. where you are othered, but um, right. especially students. So my experience with the students, um, it has been very positive. I've never experienced any microaggression from any of my students. As I mentioned, I, like. I'm so hopeful for the next generation. There, they've been like really, really accepting and kind and nice to me. But 
Having said that, I look like a foreigner. Some of my friends who look like Asian and uh, they are non-Japanese, they have had different experiences. So I think race is absolutely um, an issue that needs to be more uh, researched. I look like a foreigner, so the reaction of my students to me, as I mentioned, sometimes even though I explain to them I'm from Iran, they see me as like a native English speaker. So I've never had any experience of like microaggression from students. And with teachers, um, I would say that um, the first time that this happened to me, I was like frozen. I didn't know how to react. And then um, the next time I tried not to sit next to that person. <laughs> and eventually I tried to ask some questions. For example, where did I have this grammar mistake? Can you show me? Or um, you had a grammar mistake on that page too, <laughs> like the other day. So I tried to ask questions and I think asking questions helped this person like eventually to also think about maybe this is not um, like a nice way of like finding mistakes in her materials or trying to teach her words. So this has stopped after the first year. Um, yeah, so my reaction is like asking questions whenever possible <laughs> and trying to help them think about what they have said. Um, at first it was difficult for me because it was all new to me, but yeah, with the students, it has never happened. They've been like extremely sweet. <laughs> Even like when I pronounce something completely wrong, <laughs> like it's not in any way of diverse, like diverse kind of Englishes. <laughs> and like one student is like, teacher, should we say it this way? And like, oh, maybe you're right. Let's search it together. So um, I'm always also showing them like I'm not the absolute, you know, knowledgeable person about all different kinds of like pronunciation of words. Maybe there is a new word to me, too. And this can happen like if I'm talking about like my first language, which is Farsi, there might be words that I don't know and I shouldn't be like, you know, the absolute master <laughs> of like, you know, the, all the knowledge about that uh, language so yeah with the students it's been very very positive experience for me all the time <laughs> that's that's good to hear and I know what you mean though about um you know it, you, you want it to be some kind of productive safe or dialogical space where you can uh let your guard down and and you know you don't have to be the absolute authority at all times you mm. also want to be able to learn uh, from your students or from uh, from their right. interaction, um, and that you know having that expectation placed on you certainly mm. pre prevents that from from from, right. from yeah yeah. Um, uh, I, I guess uh, so. A, a follow up question I, I have. Um, oh, I see we've got a question. Let's let's go to Helen Price. Mm -hmm. Helen, would you like to come in? Yes. Um. I, I I guess I always I look at teachers like yourself and and um, really admire that you've become a teacher of English when you were once obviously uh, a student um, of uh, English as a foreign language um, and I compare that to um, I moved to Japan about thirty five years ago I was very young and um, at that point uh, at that time. Uh, native speakers of English were in high demand. I right. got a job right away just because mm. right. I look like this, but I had no experience or training in teaching English. Mm. So so the contrast, you know, I see a, a big contrast. It's changed. It has changed over the years mm. while I've been there. But I just wondered if um, if there's any studies or any um, evidence that uh, teachers like yourself are given credit for this transition you've made from a into a proficient speaker of English. Thank you so much for your question. Do you mean credit from like the university, the workplace, or in terms of research? Any, anywhere. Any kind of, <laughs> okay. Anyway, it doesn't so, seem to be part right. of the conversation. Right. Thank you so much for sharing your experience and this um, 
interesting question. So in terms of research, I would say yes, especially JOLT, the biggest language association um, of like English teachers in Japan. Um, our presentation at JOLT last year, it was two years ago. So our presentation at JOLT, it was well received. And uh, then when we submitted our paper, um, we got very good reviews and we could publish our work. So I guess that was like a success. <laughs> also, we can see at JOLT, um, there are more and more workshops related to different varieties of English. For example, recently we have Global English SIG and they're gonna have their first conference soon. Um, so little changes in terms of, I would say research is happening at the workplace. Um, I would say no. So uh, to me, the hiring practice is the darkest one which is like, I think very, very, very hard to make even a very small change in it because people who have the power who are at the top, like a lot of them, they have a lot of stereotypes about the best you know, English language teacher and the best English language teacher is a native English speaker. Even though now, for example, JOLT has banned using the um, term native English speaker in the advertisement. And I see that a lot of ads now, they don't use it. They say like proficient, like English speaker or something like that. But in reality, when I talk to friends who are in the hiring positions, native teachers or particularly white teachers are being preferred. Like even though it's not in paper, still in practice, um, this is like happening and um, making the change at the top, I think it's like very, very hard. So for me, I was very lucky that I have a boss who is like really into increasing the diversity, but mm, at the university level or any other level, any credit, I would say no. <laughs> Still, it's very hard for me to even think about finding the next job if I want to apply for the next job. And I don't know what's going to happen. And I don't even know if I want to work in a place that they would prefer a native English speaking teacher. Um, but yeah, seeing JOLT that is changing little by little, seeing research works that are being published about this topic and um, small six of JOLT working on this topic. I think changes are happening, but yeah, it takes... I think such a long time, maybe for the next generation. I'm hopeful for the, this young generation in Japan when they go up to the, you know, hiring positions. I think things are going to change, but maybe 30, 40 years later, I think big changes are going to happen. As you said, like 30 years ago, things were like so um, on that side are changing. Th things are changing now. We are through the transition phase, but I think the next... 30, 40 years, things are going to change. Like we can see a big change then. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. Can I just follow up on Helen's question and ask if yes. these hiring practices and your experiences of them are particular to the university sector or do you think that this is widely shared across uh, across job, mm. jobs across the sector? Right. I would say um, outside university, it can be even worse. Um, and this is from the conferences that I attended and based on the other dual ethnographic studies that I listened to, especially Japanese teachers. Like oftentimes Japanese teachers at the Eikaiwa or English language uh, conversational schools, they are getting paid less than non -na not, uh, like native teachers. Um, and sometimes it can be twice or three times more. And I remember the first time that I heard this, like at a presentation, I was like speechless, how that, this can happen. As I mentioned to you before, sometimes I've been treated as a native teacher because of how I look. I look like a foreigner. So they categorize me as a native English um, teacher, especially for the Japanese teachers. There is a lot of discrimination going on. And I think outside university, it's it's even worse. Things again are changing, but yeah. 
in terms of the huge pay gap or how they are being treated or the type of classes that they are being offered. For example, Japanese teachers, and I wrote about that a little bit in the paper, um, usually they are being offered um, like um, reading classes or writing classes, whereas the native teachers, they are being offered like communication or conversation type of presentation type of classes or higher level classes. And how do they categorize native or Japanese is by the passport, which is like very, very, you know, um, yeah, <laughs> probably you can find the word. For example, I have a Japanese friend and she has Japanese passport, but she was born and raised in America. And she is a returnee person. She just came back from America like a couple of years ago and she can't even speak Japanese well, you know. <laughs> and she's being treated as a Japanese person because of the um, passport that she has. Um, some institutions, they accept other criteria, but oftentimes they just look at your passport. And if you have the passport, but you haven't, you know, lived abroad or you haven't used English in an English speaking country, they just look at your passport. <laughs> so the, 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 the idea is very, very problematic. And um, yeah, but still, again, as I told you, the hiring practice is just a work in progress. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. That certainly lends itself to a nice comparative study with other countries, other contexts where yeah. you know, th this is this is very much also the case. Um, you know, with English language teaching elsewhere in, in East Asia and, and, and the Middle East. Um, there are a lot of similarities, I would say. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the end of the hour. Uh, my honor, uh, having CG seminar for the year. So that, that wraps up <laughs> the year. Uh, we will resume in uh, 2024, I believe, with a book launch on uh, Thursday, the 11th of January. You can find the events on the uh, research cghe.org website. So that brings us to an end here. Thank you, Mahube. Thank you, everyone, for attending. And we'll Thank see you, you so much, Lee. Happy holidays. Thank you. Thank you.